Australia's stunning coastline has recently been ravaged by a deadly predator. It was the second day in a row swimmers were forced out of the water. The community is under siege, with beaches closed and tourism in tatters. Human remains were discovered washed up on shore. Australia's largest state has become the deadliest shark attack zone on the planet. There's certainly a huge concern in the community. The great white shark. It's just a fierce, fierce creature. Responsible for five fatalities in just 10 months. Two people were totally consumed, two were bitten in half, and the fifth one was so severely mauled. Now, these terrifying events from the closest encounters. I just saw this massive shadow of a shark and just blood some who have lost. It's just one of those things that you just think will never happen to your family. And the lucky ones who survived. I thought, I'm dead. We explore why this terrifying phenomenon is happening. Clearly something has changed. So little is known about sharks, and that's the problem. That's a massive shark. And for the first time, we need to coexist with sharks. The unique shark investigation team reveals extraordinary shark attack technology. Wow. Oh, yeah. We should have a product for the market pretty soon. Which will change the way we enter the water forever. This is Australia's deadliest shark coast. Western Australia's coastline spans over 12,000 kilometres of some of the most beautiful beaches in the world. But recently, they've become the most dangerous. Western Australia had a, a, a charm period between 1925, when there's an attack at Cottesloe, and 2000, when Ken Crew was taken at North Cottesloe. That's a period of 75 years in the metropolitan area. But attacks have escalated in, in recent years. We've had 10 since 2005, and we've had five in less than 12 months. This unprecedented spate of fatal shark attacks has triggered a wave of fear amongst the West Australian community. The impact has a profound effect on the lives of many especially those unlucky enough to witness these horrific events. I'll just pull the car up there and drop it in just there. It's cooking. 22-year-old surfer Matt Holmes travelled two hours north from Perth with his mates to a popular surfing location called Wedge Island. Yeah, we were just so excited to run around, throwing the ski in as quick as we could to get out there. Together, they had years of experience surfing the West Australian coast. But there was nothing that could prepare these three young men for what was about to happen. It just looked so safe out in that water. It just felt like a perfect day. Using his jet ski, Matt began towing his friend out to the breakers where they could take turns surfing the waves. We'd been in the water for, I reckon, an hour and a half. We were just towing up to two blokes that were probably 100 metres away, and I signalled to Nathan to turn around. I looked back forward and just saw some guy just get attacked by a shark. Matt watched in horror as the five-metre great white shark moved through the waves like a torpedo. It sort of hit him and then drove him into the water. Just water going everywhere. And within five to ten seconds, the thrashing just turned all red. And there was blood. Matt quickly took his friend into shore. Help my mate! The guy's mate, he was just screaming at me. My, mate! my mate's out the back. And I just remember holding the jet ski just flat out. I was just flying through the waves. And as I got close to the guy, a set came and I just hit the set flat out and I was just airborne. And when I was airborne, I looked over and I just saw this massive shadow of a shark and just blood. 
I just wanted to get him out of the water. I was so focused on getting him, I was leaning down off the side and the ski was rolling and I heard like a thrash of a tail and I turned behind me and the shark was behind the ski and just followed me around. I felt it touch the ski and I just thought, oh, I'm going to roll over here. The great white then began to exhibit the behaviour of a top order predator. And the shark just slowly just followed me around and it was just sort of eyeballing me. It was just fending me off the guy. Just the way it was just hugging me off him, I couldn't get any closer. They say they fight humans and let go. This shark was determined. This shark was fending me off the body. The shark wanted him. Despite placing his own life at risk, Matt's efforts were to no avail. As I got closer to him, he just took the rest of him and dove off into the white water. No one on the beach that day could predict the horrific events that unfolded so quickly and that tragically took the life of Ben Linden. He was 24. His body was never recovered. Witnesses say the shark was at least four to five metres. With one bite, it cut the young victim clean in two. Ben would become the fifth shark attack victim in less than 10 months. And Western Australia would earn the unenviable title as the world's deadliest shark coast. Several beaches were closed yesterday. It was the second day in a row swimmers were forced out of the water. There's no doubt attacks are up. The question is why? As the media feeding frenzy on shark hysteria gathers momentum... A killer shark is prowling Western Australia's southwest coast. The authorities launch a full-scale shark task force to investigate why this is happening. The government had to respond to a, a situation of five fatalities. That was unusual and clearly something has changed. I'm of the view, whether it's scientific or anecdotal evidence, that the number of sharks have increased and that has proved to be a threat. Investigations into all five recent shark fatalities reveal just one suspect. The Great White Shark, recognised as the fiercest predator on the planet. Many believe their protected status over the past 15 years may be to blame. The great white shark's been protected in Australia since 1997 and in Western Australia for the, the same period. One of the enduring theories is that since their protection, their numbers have exploded. So what is drawing the sharks into the Western Australian coastline? To be honest, it's, it's a really difficult question to answer. I think that there are definitely times of year where sharks are more common off of the WA coast, and there are times of year when they've kind of left the coast and have gone to other regions. Theories include the resurgence in whale and seal populations along the coast, while others believe a decrease in fish stocks has the sharks coming closer into shore looking for food. You know, there always has been sharks, um, but not like there has been the last few years. They're following the cray boats around while they're pulling pots every day. Sharks, and it'll probably be the same sharks, are following the boats because they're letting go of their old bait. And also it's attracting the smaller fish at feeding on that bait as well, so it's a very easy feed for them. Scientists believe a significant rise in the ocean's temperature may also be bringing sharks closer into the coastline, looking for cooler pockets of water. White sharks are more common in cooler temperate waters, but they do move very large distances out of those typical temperature regimes. The Department of Fisheries launches an extensive shark monitoring program to investigate the great white's movement patterns. The thing about white sharks is that they're an inherently difficult species to study and the research we're embarked on now is probably going to take a number of years before we have any conclusive answers about how the sharks are using waters off Western Australia and how that relates to the frequency of shark attacks we've had in the last year. If the scientists were honest, they would give us those three little words, which are simply, we don't know. So little is known about sharks, and that's the problem. While the quest for answers continues, the world's attention turns on Western Australia's south coast. Peter Kerman was moored while diving, but the 33-year-old couldn't be saved.
On a windswept beach south of Perth, Sharon Burden weeps alone. This is where her son Kyle was taken by a killer shark. In the coastal town of Busselton, the impact from shark attacks has seen an 80% drop in bookings at the local dive shop. Even though there has been a lot of attacks in a short time, we've still been trying as hard as possible to continue business as usual. Diving in the area for the past 19 years, Alicia has her own thoughts on why there may be more great whites along the south coast. There are theories about why we've had so many attacks in such a short time, and one of them is because of a large female that has resided at Cape Naturalist for many years, and just the fact that a female resides there brings in males looking to mate. Could this be the rogue shark that claimed the life of 31-year-old father of two, Nick Edwards? That morning I was getting ready for work and usually Nick would go down to Gracetown for a morning surf. Oh, let's get you ready for daddy, hey? Nathan was at school and Lucy was waiting for him to get home because he would care for her while I went to work. This morning he didn't come home, so straight away I thought that he was hanging around for that last wave and he was going to be a little bit late. A short distance away in Gracetown, local surfer Rob Alder was watching from his balcony as his mate hit the waves. Rob was supposed to be with Nick, but fate kept him at home. I'd been watching him for about 20 minutes. I left the binoculars to put on my wetsuit. In those few seconds, there was a sudden and vicious attack in the water. I came back to the binoculars and saw just a half a board uh, bobbing around and I thought maybe he'd had a heavy wipeout and possibly broken his board, which is not uncommon here, and that he'd surfaced but I let a couple of waves roll through and he didn't come up. And then I figured something wasn't right. And so I jumped on my bike after calling the sea rescue. As I was cycling down the path, there was somebody running back up yelling, shark, shark. When I arrived down here on the point, my friend Craig was already in the water up to his waist. He started waving at me furiously, so I ran down to where he was. He was handling a person, a, 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 obviously a surfer. Was, he had a wetsuit on, and he was uh, trying to get him out of the water, but uh, the rocks are really difficult here. So together we uh, managed to lift him, and it was then that I realized that he'd been attacked by a shark. But in the frenzy, Rob had not identified the shark attack victim. He was about to get the shock of his life. There were quite severe lacerations on his upper thigh and the calf of his right leg. Nick. As they assess the victim's injuries, Rob Alder is shocked to discover it's his surfing buddy, Nick. Here, here, pressure here, here. I took the leg rope off my board and wrapped it around his uh, thigh as a tourniquet and started CPR and mouth to mouth. The fellow surfers desperately tried to revive Nick until the paramedics arrive. Is that yummy, baby? Meantime, Nick's yeah. wife, Melissa, is at home, oblivious to the drama that is unfolding. At that time, I was quite anxious and um, I started ringing the hospital. Yeah, can you tell me if someone's been admitted by the name of Nick Edwards? But I thought something may have happened no, to him, yeah. like, okay. you know, was hurrying home and had been in an accident. Around 20 minutes after he'd been dragged unconscious from the water, Nick Edwards was rushed by paramedics to Margaret River District Hospital. At this point, Melissa had become quite frantic. She had heard news there had been a shark attack where Nick had been surfing. I've rung my family and said there's been an attack and I'm 
quite worried about Nick. I can't get in contact with him. Mrs Edwards. Yeah. And Check then there's a knock at the door and um, the police are here. I heard about your husband. <laughs> they say that there's been an accident and straight away, I guess, I just knew what the news was. The victim was dragged from the water unconscious. He died on the way to hospital. For Melissa, coming to terms with her husband's sudden death had her reassess how she felt about sharks. When they are coming close to shore and putting people in danger, I think it's really important if they can't be removed from the area, then that they are destroyed. Somebody said to me, what right do we have to play God with the sharks? There's no price you could put on a human life. But in the rising debate on culling sharks, conservationists fear the wrong message is getting across. White sharks are the apex predator in our marine environment and um, it's really important to understand uh, how important they are. If you, if you take out apex predators in an ecosystem, all the other lower predators multiply and the whole system comes out of balance. So we do need to protect white sharks and if people enjoy eating local seafood, they enjoy scuba diving, whatever it is about the marine environment they enjoy, they have to understand that white sharks are critical to maintaining that balance. In Perth, daily shark sightings force the closure of many popular swimming beaches. But despite the increased shark threat, there are still a few brave souls who aren't afraid to venture into the water. I'd just like to welcome everyone aboard Blue Destiny. My name's Mark, I'm the skipper. Today, divers are heading to the northern tip of Rottnest Island, a popular tourist island just off the coast of Perth. Do you agree with the so. <laughs> With some trepidation, they're about to dive the exact same location, which only 12 months ago was the scene of a horrific shark attack. It was late October when 32-year-old American diver Tom Wainwright met his fate. Anybody who's taken by a shark is unlucky, uh, and Tom Wainwright was particularly unlucky. There had never been a shark attack at Rottnest in all the hundred and something years that people have been going there. Sergeant Pete Bayon was on duty that day. He was called to investigate the circumstances surrounding the attack. Tom and his two friends, Alison and Justin, had decided to go diving on the north of Rottnest. They were all qualified divers. But despite being with his two dive buddies, Tom decided to dive solo. It was a fateful decision. As moments after entering the water, Tom was attacked by a four meter great white shark. Justin and Alison noticed a disturbance on the surface where a huge amount of bubbles came to the top. Along with the bubbles came a large amount of blood. And Justin and Alison knew their friend was in grave danger. Oh. They've gone over to where Tom is and they managed to pull him on board. They saw that he received a massive injury to his left side. His left arm was missing and there seemed to be a circular bite uh, from the top of the shoulder, which had gone around through to the centre of his chest and out to the, through to his left hip. So it was like a half moon shape that had gone. It was a brutal, savage bite. Shark hunting patrols are resuming this morning for the Great White that's believed to be responsible. Tom Wainwright would become the second shark fatality in less than two weeks, following the disappearance of a swimmer at the beach suburb of Cottesloe. After two days of searching, the only trace of Bryn Martin are his speedos. Triggering speculation that a rogue shark may be responsible. And for shark author Hugh Edwards, it's a theory that should not be ruled out. It is not unlikely that you've got one shark that has, is either old and are finding natural pay difficult to catch or has found how easy human beings are to catch. 
The problem is it's very hard to collect direct evidence of what shark's been involved in an attack. But based on all the circumstantial evidence, um, such as the size of the shark, the locations, the periods between shark attacks, there's not a very strong case that the same shark has been involved in all of our attacks over here. Serial offender or not, the Western Australian government moves to allow the killing of any shark that poses an imminent threat. If a shark is staying around a popular tourist beach area uh, and staying within that vicinity, um, it's got to feed. Um, that's the harsh reality, so there is a threat there. I take a view that we have a responsibility to protect people using the beach, particularly families and young children. So this deadly hunter has now become the hunted. The baited hooks were set up in a capture and kill operation, the first of its kind in WA. One of the big problems is actually even establishing what an imminent threat is. If a shark is seen and has been spotted and people have been removed from the water, then there really isn't an imminent threat anymore. So it seems to be quite an impractical policy, but the impact it's having on people is actually to increase the fear that we're trying to remove without really making people safer. As an alternative to killing sharks, the government assembles a special team of shark experts at the University of Western Australia to investigate how to make people feel safer in the water. We've got the two white shark brains here. Yep. Professor Sean Collin, a world leader in shark sensory biology, leads a team of specialists who have spent many years attempting to understand shark behaviour. The great white shark is one of the largest predators in the world of the cartilaginous fishes family. It's been around over 400 million years and has developed a whole battery of sensors that makes an exquisitely tuned predator. The team's research into shark sensory systems has led to the development of new shark deterrents, which the team is now preparing to... This show was created for you and your family to watch together. Welcome to Nacho Wild. Test in the field. For the first time, they are packing up their entire laboratory and taking it into the domain of these deadly predators. This is a large undertaking, but I believe this is a, a wonderful opportunity to restore confidence of the public to re-enter our beautiful waters. As they embark on their 1,100 kilometer journey north, the team is hopeful that they'll get some results. Whenever you are developing something in a lab, however great it is, you need to go and test it with some real sharks because they're going to be the ones that, that tell us whether it works or not. Shark scientists from the University of Western Australia are about to test new shark deterrent technology in an effort to make people feel safer in the water. At a remote beach location, the Oceans team is about to trial an eco-alternative to the highly controversial shark nets that are used in some parts of the world. Netting on beaches has been used for many years to deter sharks, but there's a lot of evidence now to suggest that that is not effective and that, in fact, sharks and many other marine life are killed by these nets. The alternative is a bubble curtain which quite simply is a wall of bubbles designed to interfere with the shark's senses, including hearing, as well as the shark's lateral line. Lateral line extends over the head and flank of all sharks and detects very minute water movement as the animal moves through the water. Research suggests that sharks will be frightened away by the interference caused by the bubbles. This theory is reinforced after a few days of testing in the field. Oh, and you can see it perfectly how he's well within the um, testing area. Sharks are recorded entering the bubble free zone, while amazingly, no sharks venture into the bubble net area. We've taken something that was developed in the lab, we've shown we can actually test it in the field, so it's been an absolute success. The team is hopeful that one day bubble curtains will become an eco-alternative to shark nets around the world. Setcom, setcom. Back in Perth, shark patrols are stepped up to combat the increased shark activity. 
A massive four-metre white pointer shark, half the length of the water police boat. Yeah, where's the nippers? Here, the rescue helicopter spots this deadly predator lurking frighteningly close to a group of children. Hundreds of teenagers were forced out of the water. They were competing in a surf life-saving carnival when the monster was spotted. Meanwhile, off the WA coast, the Department of Fisheries Shark Monitoring Program uncovers some interesting information. We've monitored 16 sharks off the Perth coast now. All of them have done things very differently while they're here. Some sharks um, are simply passing through, spend very little time here. Other sharks are here over more extended periods. The monitoring program includes the use of new satellite receivers, enabling shark alerts to be posted on social media sites when tagged sharks swim into populated areas. The siren's just gone. But it's the untagged sharks which pose the biggest threat to beachgoers. And for that, it's up to the surf lifesavers. Surfcom, Surfcom, this is Sorrento Patrol. Volunteer surfcom. surf lifesaver Bernie Williams knows firsthand how vulnerable we are in the ocean. A group of friends decided we'd like to get a scuba ticket. So that was probably 30 years ago and have enjoyed it ever since, uh, till recently. A few years ago, Bernie was with these same friends, diving an ocean reef off the coast of Perth. We're just cruising along the reef. Uh, I heard a boat coming quite close to our boat where he'd been anchored. So while Brian and Jenny carried on the reef, I went up to the surface, checked, couldn't see a boat near our boat, so I then came back down. I couldn't immediately see my dive buddies, Jenny and Brian. Suddenly alone in the ocean depths, Bernie searches for his friends, and then out of the blue comes his worst nightmare, a four-metre great white shark on the attack. I just felt this sudden impact on my side. And I was pushed through the water. I saw a big black eyeball within about five centimetres of my face. And my arm was in its mouth, and the alarm bells just went off in my head. Miraculously, Bernie managed to free his arm from the massive jaws and was able to make his way to the ocean floor to seek shelter. Then my arm really started hurting quite badly, and the water started getting a very polluted look to it, a very sheeny look to it, and I realised that I was bleeding quite badly. Things couldn't get much worse for Bernie until the Great White continued to stalk its prey. The shark was just circling. I had my spear gun with me. To fend the shark off, I poked it in the nose as it brushed me. I think it knew that it had a meal there. I was tucked up against the reef watching the shark when I felt someone touch me on the shoulder, and it was the dive buddies. Literally, as soon as I felt the touch on my shoulder, the shark just turned around and it disappeared. But Bernie's ordeal wasn't over yet. That trip from the bottom to the surface had to be the most frightening trip you could ever think of because the speed of these sharks it could have quite easily attacked us and made mincemeat of us in the water. Finally, they reached the surface and with the help of some nearby fishermen, all three divers make it to safety. Bernie realises it was a lucky escape. He attributes his survival to a portable shark repellent device. My belief is one of my dive buddies, Brian, was wearing a shark shield, and I think that probably deterred it uh, because it just took off. The shark shield works by emitting an electrical current that theoretically deters sharks within a three meter radius of the device. Oh, 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 right at the surface. Big one. 
Right now, the Shark Shield is being tested by the Oceans team off the WA coastline. So we're just uh, attaching the Shark Shield uh, to the top of the rig here. The scientists have baited and set a number of stereo camera rigs, and all they have to do is wait. Recent testing using the Shark Shield on Great Whites showed the device had a clear effect on the animal's behaviour. But it also showed that the shark was not repelled in all situations. Essentially, if a long enough uh, period of time was given, the sharks would eventually still take the bait while the device was active. And so, really, it's still a little inconclusive as to whether this device is really functioning as effectively as it could do. Now. Yeah. And when the scientists review the footage from their own experiment... And he just goes yeah, up. On the nose yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, he's got it on the beak. The results reinforce the theory that the sharks get used to the device over a period of time. Yeah, he's now straight away coming back. Yeah. 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 So really what we need to do is look at ideas and how we can actually change the electric field so that when those sharks come round again, they're not presented with the same original source. It's actually a different field. And so this would then continue to be an effective repellent over a long period of time. It's not just surfers, divers or swimmers that are at risk. Any surf craft on the water is in danger of being attacked by sharks. As Martin Kane discovered, while surf skiing with friends at a popular beach just north of Perth. When you get out there at sunrise, it's a very spiritual experience. It's just a great, great way to start a day. It was on one such day that Martin and friends encountered a pod of dolphins, a stunning and quite common event, except these dolphins were behaving strangely. There's about five dolphins on my right as I passed by. We're actually huddled up together in a very tight formation, almost floating. And we stopped for a while. Martin stopped, but a few of the rest of us stopped for a bit longer because we were so interested in it. Martin began to paddle off, leaving the group behind. And at that moment, a three-metre great white shark began moving towards him at a speed estimated to be up to 45 kilometres per hour. And then this almighty crash and bang. Ah! So I grabbed the ski in its jaws, lifted it up in the air, probably two or three metres, and then I toppled out on, on the front. Martin's screams went through the air and all I could see was the, the ski being spun around and just thrashing and, and splashing. When Martin finally surfaced, he realised he'd been attacked by the world's deadliest predator. It was just an awesome power, this thing. The tail was just going, you know, left to right like this and the head was going in the same direction. And I could hear a sort of a hum coming off. You know, just an amazing, just, just a fierce, fierce creature, absolutely, you know, going ballistic. The shark had ripped a huge hole in Martin's surf ski, and he was 150 metres from shore and even further from his friends. I was swimming to shore, felt like in, in concrete almost, and all I was thinking of, perhaps he's going to take my legs or I get chopped in two. With the great white right behind him, Martin was now swimming for his life. All that was going through my mind at the time was, I'm dead, perhaps he's going to take my legs, or I get chopped in two. Luckily for Martin, his friends Kim and Dale were quick to react. Dale said, get on the back of the ski. So I scrambled up like a mad cow and nearly tipped him into the water. All four men were still in danger so they grouped closely together and paddled for their lives. If the shark had come back in any, any, any direction, then the guys would have, would have uh, had a go at it. But it wasn't until I got to the beach and looked back out to my ski to see the shark doing a, a victory lap around my ski that I really thought, oh my God, that was close. Since the attack, Martin has reassessed his relationship with the sea. It's changed the, the confident attitude that we used to have, you know, go out in the mornings, 
bit of deep breathing, you know, fresh air, dolphins, to uh, the sharks out there, you know. Western Australia, many of the shark sightings have been caught on video. Weather looks good, nice swell. And none more chilling than this footage, taken by freediver Nathan Podmore while on a diving expedition four and a half hours north of Perth. Uh, hopefully there's a few fish about. When Nathan and his friend Dave enter the water, there are a few fish about, but just not the ones they were expecting in the water for a couple of minutes. I just next minute just heard Dave just scream my name. There's definitely something in his voice that just said, we're in a bit of strife. And I uh, turned around and it was just like, whoa. The two young men are confronted by a four meter great white shark. It was unbelievable. Just look, they're like a torpedo underwater. They're absolutely massive and it came in straight at us both and it sort of just broadsided in front of us. I, I had a good opportunity to just give it a good whack, sort of as hard as I could whack, I punched it in the side of its face and it didn't like it much. Incredibly, Nathan and Dave were able to scramble aboard their boat. <laughs> Holy you don't see one of them every day and you, you don't want to see one of them every day. It's something extraordinary. On this occasion, the boys were lucky to have a spear gun for protection. But in most cases, the only thing between you and a shark is the wetsuit. And off the coast of Western Australia, the ocean scientists believe they have finally found a way to make the wetsuit shark-proof. Dave, so these are some of the wetsuit designs that we've come up with using... After years of research, they're about to test new wetsuit prototypes, which have been designed in conjunction with a leading product developer. The most common question that we get asked when anybody gets a wetsuit is, I don't want to look like a seal, and what colour do sharks like? Well, we think now, based on the science that's been done, the, the research that's been done so far, we know the answer to that question. The answer comes following the Ocean Institute's compelling study of the evolution of the shark brain. Here, Dr. Kara Yopak compares the brains of a great hammerhead shark and a manta ray with the smallest brain of them all. Believe it or not, that's the brain of the great white shark, which is actually quite small relative to its body size. But what is really impressive about the great white brain are these visual brain regions, which are these two lobes located here. And this is the part of the brain that receives the majority of visual input. So what this tells us is that the great white is actually a very visual predator. And so it's, it's far more likely that using a visual repellent is going to be more effective in this species. This leads to the research team's breakthrough discovery, revealing sharks may actually be colorblind. Once you know what the shark can see, you can then start to design things which will either be um, very visible to the shark or actually um, quite cryptic to the shark. With this knowledge, the new prototype wetsuit designs include a camouflage suit for divers, while surfers will adopt a striped base pattern, much like a poisonous sea snake, and shown underneath this surfboard. The strategies are twofold. One is a can't see me strategy, cryptic in the water, and the other one is a can see me but don't eat me strategy. The idea being that even though you're perceived, you're not perceived as a meal. Today, the Oceans team is about to test the camouflage design against the popular black wetsuit. Each test wetsuit will be filled with a mix of fish and tuna oil attached to a stereo camera rig and lowered to the ocean's depths, where hopefully some sharks will take the bait. Just watch the waves, boys. And now, the answer to the biggest question of all. Do the shark-proof wetsuit designs actually work? Right, that used to be our experiment. Because it looks like one of the wetsuits has just become shark food. I think we might have uh, found a shark. Oh, my We've just pulled the treatment out of the water. The black wetsuit has had significant shark attacks, significant damage. Take it down the back, Carol, and have a look at the teeth mark. The black wetsuit appears to have been mauled by a shark, 
So now the team is anxious to see if the camouflage wetsuit has been attacked or whether the new design really is shark-proof. We've just pulled out one of our designs as well and that hasn't suffered any damage at all, so very good early signs. The team retrieves the underwater camera and reviews the footage to find out what actually happened. And there she goes. Okay. She's having a bite. All right. Look at that, she's nearly getting the barrel in her, in her mouth. Yes, sir. That's a massive shark. This huge tiger shark destroys the traditional black wetsuit in one bite, desperate to get the bait hidden inside. And this is the control. And to reinforce the science, even though this barrel is filled with the same bait, this deadly predator shows little interest in the new camouflaged wetsuit, leaving it completely unscathed. If you compare this with what happened with the, the control, oh. I mean, While it might be early days, there is no denying this is a significant breakthrough, which may just revolutionise the world's wetsuit market. It's full steam ahead from here. We'll, we'll, we'll continue the science and the research, and um, we should have a, a product for the market pretty soon that's going to make people feel a lot more comfortable about being in the water. Any encounter with a great white shark is going to leave its mark. It's down there, right? And for Matt Holmes, it has had a profound effect. Every night, every night, the whole thing goes through my head. And what I could have done different, and if what I did was enough. Today, Matt has returned to the beach where a great white shark claimed Ben Linden's life. I still remember going out through here, just flat out. But he can only watch on as his friend takes their beloved jet ski out for a spin. I struggle to go out on the boat for a fish nowadays. I just feel like it's all going to happen in front of me again. I just never thought it would happen, but unfortunately in WA it's happening all the time. Going back to Gracetown is a good feeling for me and the children because that's where we feel closest to Nick. The loss of Melissa's husband, Nick, means her life and the lives of her children will never be the same. Because Lucy's quite young, we go down onto the sand and there's a cross still in the sand, so she decorates it and plays in the sand. And despite a great connection to the ocean, the young family isn't ready to venture back in. And I know Nathan's never going to go in the water again. And the question remains, will it ever be safe to go back into the water? There is no doubt that the shark fatalities and the increased sightings of sharks has affected the behaviour of people. So it's affecting our lifestyle because one of the great things of West Australia are our beautiful beaches, our long coastline and the enjoyment of that environment. Despite the great white shark being the apex predator of the world's oceans, That's a massive shark. and all the scientific minds and money behind the research, these formidable animals remain an enigma. But shark scientists believe that is all about to change. It's my hope that we can very soon understand more about the shark and the environment in which it lives. We need to coexist with sharks. Their presence within our ecosystems is vital. At the moment, the only certain things we can say is that there will be another shark attack. But we don't know when and we don't know where. And there is one more certainty. For now, Western Australia remains the world's deadliest shark coast.